Sarah Ha was caught uploading contacts, rope maker changes emails post delivery, default credentials are still impacting Internet of Things devices, and a new crowdfunding campaign for Malware Tech Blog is now up and running. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for August 29th, 2017, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. If you haven't checked out our Patreon yet, please do so. We have lots that we want to do for the show, but we can't do it without your support. Patreon.com slash ThreatWire is the place to support ThreatWire, and we are fully funded by Patreon. So big thanks to our patrons, and the link is in the show notes. And now, it's on to our top stories, on to the news. First off, Sarah Ha is an anonymous messaging app that allows you to leave messages for people without them knowing who the message came from. It has been all the rave on social media with over 18 million downloads across mobile operating systems, but is also a breeding ground for harassment. Unbeknownst to the user, the application uploads contact phone numbers and email addresses to Sarah Ha's servers, simply under the permission that it just needs access to your contacts so that it can tell you who else has downloaded the the app. Now there is nothing stating that the contacts would also be uploaded to their servers. This was first discovered by Bishop Fox security researcher Zachary Julian when his device alerted him of data being transmitted. Julian used software called Burp Suite to show the contact uploading in action in a video linked below. Now the creator tweeted replies to the original story stating that it was meant to be used for a find your friends feature and the database does not currently hold a single contact. Obviously, without being open sourced or having third party audits, we have no actual way of telling what data is actually in their databases. The creator also mentioned that this would be removed in the next update of the app. Julian also pointed out that their privacy policy clarifies that it'll ask for permission before using your data. Now, strangely, the app is supposed to be anonymous, so a find your friends feature sounds completely out of place, don't you think? If you have downloaded Sarah Ha and you have a new Android phone, Marshmallow or newer, you can change the app permissions under settings, app, hit the little gear button, and then hit app permissions. Sarah Ha users can also not use the app at all and just send and receive messages through the website instead. Big thank you to Joe for sending in this story. If you are a patron, you can send your favorite stories to me via the community tab over on patreon.com slash threatwire to be featured in the show. Big thanks to Joe. Hey, that rhymed. A new attack vector could also allow an attacker to change an email after it has been delivered to the recipient. Dubbed Rope Maker, which stands for Remotely Originated Post Delivery Email Manipulation Attacks, Keeping Email Risky, the attack takes advantage of the the ability to change CSS code in HTML-based emails, which is possible whenever an email client connects to a remote CSS library to grab the correct email template, etc., etc. The attack could do a sort of man-in-the-middle attack to the connection with a malicious link or image that the client could potentially click through to a malicious site. Content can stay the same to the user's eye. By editing the CSS, an attacker could display the new link. According to security researcher Francisco Bureau, RoboMaker does not work on browser-based emails like Gmail or iCloud, but it does work on desktop apps. Current email security systems do not read into the code of CSS, and they only look for detectable URLs that could end up be phishing. Spam filters would not detect the changes to the CSS code, and as such, these emails could pass with absolutely no problem to a user. Rubiro also mentioned that he has not seen this attack in the wild. Now, since Rubiro has disclosed this to the email clients, neither Microsoft nor Apple have chosen to address it. Furthermore, RoteMaker does not have a CVE number because the functionality falls outside vendor security scope. Now, you can disable HTML emails and only accept plain text emails to defend against RoteMaker. Alternatively, use a web-based client as those are not affected. Internet of Things devices are prone to being a popular attack vector for cyber criminals due to the fact that many manufacturers create products that either one, do not support encryption, updates, or proper security protocols, or two, 
They have burned in credentials that a user cannot change or are very hard to change. Security researchers recently found a list on Pastebin of over 8,000 IP addresses, of which 2,000 were running open Telnet servers as of this weekend. Almost 2,000 of them were using leaked credentials, and of the over 8,000 IPs, they were, for the most part, just using 144 unique username and password pairs, which basically means they were the original manufacturer settings and they were never changed. With Internet of Things malware becoming more and more common throughout the likes of botnets like Mirai, which happened last year, it's easy to deduce that these were probably used to spread malware as well. Many of the devices in this list were already controlled by a botnet as we kind of figured out as suggested by their usernames and their passwords. Many of the 144 that had user-generated credentials or were manufacturer user-generated were simple enough to brute force anything ranging from admin to one, two, three, four, five, six, to password for a password. Those were actually being used. Now, if you own Internet of Things devices, including your own router, be aware that default credentials should be updated to unique ones that are user generated and that most botnets do not survive on a device after it is rebooted, but they can come back and haunt you. We are still waiting on the day that Internet of Things manufacturers start taking security seriously, but in the meantime, we can vote with our wallets and we can only buy technology that has the security that we deserve. At least that's what I'm gonna be doing, or maybe I just won't buy any at all. In our ongoing story on Marcus Hutchins, who pleaded not guilty recently to creating or distributing Kronos malware, as of last week, his legal defense fund was shut down due to over 150,000 in donations being fraudulent. According to Tor Aikland, who was helping run the original campaign, their credit card processor caught most donations that were fraud, but they are refunding the rest of the legitimate donations as well. In a quote to Ars Technica, Eklund said that they are, quote, not sure what is the legitimate. I did make a kind of tweet storm after originally hearing about this since I used to work at a credit card processing company and closing a campaign due to fraudulent cards seemed a little odd to me. A new campaign has been created for legal defense funds at Crowd Justice. The new crowdfunding campaign was created by Tara Wheeler, a friend of Malware Tech, at crowdjustice.com slash case slash Malware Tech. And the link is in the show notes in case that was too long. Now, in a phone call with Wheeler on Monday morning, she explained that, quote, the campaign has raised around $6,000 since it opened on Monday morning. I vetted crowd justice for two weeks before we decided to go with them. They are transparent and responsive. They received some fraudulent transactions and were able to fix it within nine minutes total with a Cloudflare wall and a CAPTCHA. The site uses multi-factor authentication and a secure account. Crowd justice is set up specifically for legal funds, so I can't touch the funds whatsoever However, all donations go into the specified attorney's trust account. Now, when asked how long the campaign is set to go for, Wheeler also commented that, quote, I believe what'll be important is to not lose sight that it'll be a long fight. Marcus has so much community support, so we want to make sure that the crowd justice campaign will be acknowledged as such. People donate for several reasons. For some, it comes down to being afraid of the CFAA. There's a beautiful comment on the crowdfunding page that says, today you, tomorrow me. And I could not agree more with Wheeler's comments. His new campaign has a goal of $10,000 with a stretch goal of 15,000. All of those funds go to his legal fees. I also asked Hutchins if he wanted to add anything to my story and put simply, he said, quote, thank you for all of the support. Thank you again to all of the fine, wonderful, amazing, gracious people who contribute to patreon.com slash threatwire. You are truly the reason that we can keep on bringing you news every single week. Any little bit does help us grow the show, and in return, you will get tons of access to a bunch of extras over on Patreon, including the audio RSS feed. We might even feature your adorable fur baby in an upcoming episode. If you are a patron at that level, make sure you send in your fur baby pictures because I love seeing your pets. Check out the perk level on patreon.com and thank you again for helping us keep this show coming completely independent and ad free and of course if you cannot donate make sure to subscribe subscribe and share this episode on your favorite social media page and with that i'm shannon morse and i will see you on the internet S -s -s subscribe.